a moment, ma'am. Ma'am. You're written it, right? Yes. Raise your right hand. Left hand on the Bible. Be your friend. Testimony. I'm about to give a share of this child shall give a proof to help you out. Yes. Take a seat in the witness stand. Adjust the microphone if you have to. State your name again for the record. Start your last name. Yes. Hi. My name is Dr. Ellen Reamer, R I E M E R. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing fine. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get right to it. And uh, if you would, just uh, tell the jury a little bit about your uh, education uh, that led up to you becoming a physician, please. Yes. Okay. Well, I graduated from medical school in 1997 with a doctor of medicine degree. Following that, I did a residency in pathology at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Medical Center in the city of New York. Following that, I did a forensic pathology fellowship at the office of the chief medical examiner of the state of Maryland. Following that, I did an additional fellowship training year at Johns Hopkins Hospital, Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, also in Baltimore. And um, I am board certified in forensic pathology and anatomic pathology. Uh, after I completed my um, all my education and fellowship training, I, my, I took my first um, job at, as a forensic pathologist at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center, Wake Forest University School of Medicine in North Carolina, where I remained for uh, almost six years um, but before being recruited by the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, where I've been for 14 years as a forensic pathologist. All right, and at the Medical University of South Carolina, uh, you're, you said you're a forensic pathologist. Do you have any uh, professorship or, or teaching responsibilities yes. there? Yes. So I, um, I have um, also the title of professor of pathology and laboratory medicine. And because Medical University of South Carolina is a teaching institution, I am responsible um, for educating physicians in training as well as medical students. And um, that's an integral part of my job. So a, a lot of the work I do is um, observed by um, students and trainees. And you mentioned you had some board certifications. Can you tell those to the jury, please? Yes. So, um, you know, in order for somebody, uh, the, there's uh, the American Board of Pathology is the organization that certifies specialists um, in, in different fields. And well, the American Board of Pathology certifies specialists in um, pathology and requires them to take um, very long examinations um, and demonstrate and pass those examinations. And you can't just sit down and take them. You have to have uh, um, achieved, um, you know, gotten through your residency training and fellowship training as well. So um, I managed to do all of that. And um, I'm board certified in forensic pathology. Yes. And uh, do you have any uh, membership or involvement in any uh, professional societies that are relevant to what we're talking about? Here um, yes. Well, um, I'm a member of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. And um, I also am responsible for e editing journals. I have um, various academic responsibilities as well. All right. And you mentioned editing certain journals. Uh, have you? published in the field of pathology over the years, given your professorships and your uh, education yes. expertise? Yes. Um, so um, because I'm interested in, um, you know, educating um, the medical community, um, I published close to, I don't remember the exact number, but approximately 30 <clears throat> publications in the fields of um, pathology and forensic pathology. And um, this is also something that's valued at an academic institution. So you're not just practicing, but also contributing to the body of knowledge in your field. Uh, over the years with this, uh, this experience, have you uh, had call to conduct a number of autopsies? Yes. So the principal um, responsibility of my work is to perform autopsies on deceased individuals in order to determine the cause and manner of death. And over the course of my career, 
Um, I have, don't keep exact track, but I estimate that I've done approximately 5,500 autopsies. 5,500? Correct. All right, and we'll talk more about what an autopsy is in a minute. Uh, over that course of time doing 5,500 autopsies, have you uh, been qualified as an expert and testified in courts of record uh, in the nation? Um, yes. So um, again, I'm not keeping track of every single one, but if I, a conservative estimate would be approximately once a month for more than 20 years, which would put me in the mid to 200. So about 250, but that's a con probably a little bit more than that. And that's times you've been qualified as an expert in forensic pathology. Yes. And is that just in South Carolina or there have been other places? Um, yeah, the majority have been in South Carolina, but also um, North Carolina. Um, where I practiced uh, for six years prior to moving to South Carolina. And I've also been admitted uh, as an expert witness in forensic pathology in um, federal court a couple of times where um, I autopsied um, uh, individuals um, who died on um, tribal lands. Um, Your Honor, this time the state would move to qualify Dr. Reamer, Professor Reamer, as an expert in forensic pathology. Objection, Your Honor. She's so qualified. All right, Dr. Reamer, before we get to uh, your specific findings in this case, can you quickly describe to the jury uh, what is pathology and what is an autopsy? What is it that your science and, and uh, being a physician, what are you trying to do? Uh, yes. So the purpose of an autopsy um, is to um, obtain as much information as I can from examination of um, the tissues of the body um, and, and in order to come to a determination of the cause and manner of death. And the autopsy examination is basically a specialized surgical procedure. Um, it starts with an external examination. So before any cutting gets started, um, I look from head to toe. I look for anything unusual. Um, if there's injuries, I, I, I review them. I look at them carefully uh, and um, document those findings as well as um, establish an opinion on how injuries may have occurred. And obviously, because uh, in cases where you have traumatic injury, there's no getting around the fact that it's very graphic, the, the things that you have to look at and the things here today that you have to describe to the jury. Yes, that's just part of it. Um, did you uh, have call in uh, this particular case to examine uh, the victims of these murders, Paul Murdoch and Maggie Murdoch? Yes, um, I have the name is Margaret Mur Murdoch. I, I know she goes by Maggie, um, but Margaret Murdoch, as well as Paul Murdoch, I performed the autopsies on both of these individuals. All right, and do you recall what day that was? Um, I, I'll have to refer to my um, so. notes. Um, both of the autopsies um, on both um, Paul and Maggie were performed by me on June 10th, 2021. And is it typical when you're conducting an autopsy that you have assistants there that assist you in performing these procedures and, and that sort of thing? Yes. So um, I have assistants to help me um, with um, whatever I need. And um, the autopsies, um, I do the autopsy and any any assistance I need is done under my direction. Sure. And then is it common that photographs are taken of the various injuries and your various findings as you do the autopsy? Yes. All right. And if any physical evidence is recovered during that autopsy, is law enforcement present or some official there to take um, custody of those yeah, sorts of things? They're not always present, but um, they, they, if they're not present at the, t at the day of the autopsy, they'll come back and I um, seal all of the evidence up and um, with, um, you know, in, in secure bags, and then those are transferred to the um, appropriate um, investigator. Well, let's go ahead and, and get to it, and we're going to talk about uh, Paul Murdoch first, okay? Okay. And we also, uh, do we have um, some poster boards behind you? Uh, and the first one is uh, marked as states 
500. And can you explain very quickly what this is to the jury, please? Okay. So you may have seen these kinds of diagrams. Um, this is, these are um, blank di body diagrams. And um, so when I autopsy um, a, a man or male, um, I start with that diagram. And um, I, it, it's basically a vehicle for me to take notes during the autopsy so I can incorporate findings into my final autopsy report. But this is not you know, something that um, this is really for my um, edification, and so I can write things down, and and it it helps me when I write the autopsy report and, um, to make sure I've covered everything. And will this assist you as we uh, as you explain to the jury the injuries that the two victims suffered? Yes. Um, Dr. Reamer, let's again starting with Paul. If you could very quickly, uh, how many, um, did you observe any gunshot wounds uh, to Paul? Well, actually there were two shotgun wounds. Um, so that's a different than a, a, you know, a handgun or, um, so a shotgun is uh, where there, you know, there's uh, basically um, um, pellets that are um, enclosed in a wadding and the wadding, um, after it's fired from the shotgun, um, kind of opens up and allows all of these pellets um, to be released from the wadding. And so um, the features of his injuries um, told me in no uncertain terms that he was shot with a shotgun. And let's, if I could ask you with the court's permission, if you could step down, I'm gonna hold up this board and if you could bring a marker with you, I've got a red Sharpie right here if that helps you. And let's talk about the injuries that you observed to Paul Murdoch. And then if you could, for the jury, if you could illustrate, draw on this board um, that the, the first uh, gun sh uh, shotgun wound that you observed on Paul. All right, let me put mine up real quick. Okay. Okay, so in order to make things as clear to you as possible, I'm going to use a black marker for an entrance entrance wound and red for exit, okay? So just arbitrarily. Okay, so Paul had two shotgun wounds. Um, one of them was to the left side of the chest, approximately this location. And the, the um, wadding containing the pellets traveled beneath the skin through like the soft tissue of the left side of the chest. It didn't actually go into the chest cavity, but traveled um, beneath the, the skin and in, through the muscle and fat um, before um, exiting the left Okay, so it's kind of a straight kind of left to right, I'm sorry, right to left shot. And, um, and just real quick, when you say right to left, you're talking about Paul's right to yeah, left. Yeah, that's right. So I'm always thinking about like the patient's right to left. Okay, it's not, if we look at it, it's from, you know, would be from left to right. But I always, we always, for consistency, it's always relative to his body. Down here by the hands, could you put an R on one side and an L on the yeah, other? Sure. Just because I know I get confused. Yeah, no, it is. And honestly, we, we all do this during autopsies as well, because especially we have the back and, and um, it's very easy to make a mistake. And also just real quick, could you write Paul up at the top there? All right, thank you. All okay. right. All right, so you were talking about that first shotgun rolling into the chest and where it exited. Were yes. there any other injuries associated with that? Please continue on. Um, yes. So the, the remember we have wadding and closing pellets. The wadding actually um, got stuck, you know, didn't completely exit and continue to fly out. It got stuck right underneath the skin um, of the left side of the chest, like close to the armpit area. And we have a photograph of that um, pink wadding that um, remained um, in the skin of the exit wound. From there, multiple of um, the shotgun pellets um, started going through like the left arm, okay, starting from the underside of the left arm. So the, the, the wadding terminated in the skin and then pellets kind of went out and went through the left arm 
Um, and okay, so this is the left. Remember, this is his left side, his left, his left shoulder, his left arm. And then we've got a bunch of um, exit um, pellet wounds on the left side of the arm, and some also um, a little bit on the back. So that um, you can see this is going through, and then this is actually on the inside of the arm, and um, the exits are kind of on the left side. So, was there any uh, stippling associated with this particular wound? Yes. Okay. So there was stippling, and um, I'll draw that um, over here. Okay. So, so when a projectile comes out of the barrel of a weapon, be it a shotgun, a handgun, um, an assault rifle, um, what propels that projectile, we call, you know, projectile out of the barrel of the gun. Okay, it's it's um, gunpowder, and gunpowder is basically ignited through the action of um, the shooter with on the gun. And um, so, <coughs> gunpowder is basically burning and projects the projectile out of the barrel of the gun. A projectile can potentially travel a very long distance, like you know, many like many feet or you know, yards or a long depending on the, the projectile until it hits something, or if it doesn't hit anything, it can eventually lose power and hit, go to the ground. But um, the gunpowder that leaves the barrel of the weapon can travel um, not too far, it only travels about uh, up to three feet, depending on the weapon. So in this case, we actually have some particles of um, like abrasions from particles of gunpowder. And this is called gunpowder stippling. Okay, so we have stippling, which indicates that th this wound was fired at a fairly close range. We can't say exactly, but probably no more than three feet because that's our standard, you know, could be anywhere from two to three feet. Um, and um, interestingly enough, there was some markings on the edge of this um, kind of cookie cutter type of defect from the um, wadding going in that shows that some of the petals of the wadding are beginning to open. So this is very classic for a um, shotgun entrance wound. And um, at the autopsy shows that it went, after going through the, um, underneath the left side of the chest, it went through the left arm. All right. And let me ask you this, and, and uh, before we look at some of the, uh, the pictures, which are very graphic, is that correct? Um, yes, it's just the nature of the beast. Okay. If, uh, it, um, this particular uh, injury, was it uh, immediately fatal? Um, no. Amazingly enough, um, this really, um, if that was all he sustained, he would have needed medical attention and um, some stitches and irrigation of the wound to clean it out and make sure it doesn't get infected. But it, um, it actually did not pierce the chest or cause any internal bleeding. It did, however, cause a bruise or contusion of the left lung, and that's because you know the um, it's, there's a lot of energy associated with this, um, but didn't actually go through the ribs, um, but caused a contusion of the left lung. But if he would have been expected to be continue to be standing after this, it would not have sent him to the ground. All right. Um, if you could, there's a dowel stick over by um, your your witness stand, and I'm gonna. Make sure the jurors down here could see what you're talking about. If you could grab that for me real quick, and then uh, we'll look at uh, some of the pictures here. Okay, what do you want me to do? Well, I just wanted to show it to these jurors down here just to make sure oh, they could see sure. what you were okay. doing. And uh, okay. then uh, if you could just stay standing for me, I'm going to um, give them a bit of a stand back and to work with them.
Bringer, if you would be very careful to keep these pointed this way, if you could. But I'm going to have you just look through states 478, 479, 480, 481, and 482, and see if you recognize those images. Okay. Um, so these are um, photographs. And just real quick, just tell me if you recognize them. Um, yes. I, I recognize all of them. All right. And these images that were taken during the autopsy you conducted of Paul Murdoch? Yes. All right. And would they assist you in explaining the injuries to the jury? Yes. All right, Your Honor, this time I've moved states 478, 479, 480, 481, and 482 into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. Admitted without objection. All right. Now, Dr. Ring, if you get the dowel stick and come around here to this screen, I'm going to put this first image up on the uh, Elmo. And then if you could, we'll, we'll talk to you about these injuries and describe the jury. Okay. okay. So um, we can see, um, it's not great focus here, but um, this is the entrance uh, shotgun wound on the left side of the chest. His, his left nipple, his left nipple is over here. So it's the left side of the chest. And there is some stippling around and Dr. it. Dr. Rumor, I apologize. Okay. If you could come around and work this way. Way so that all our jurors oh, who are that way can, can see. Okay. Awesome. All right. So um, the uh, shotgun um, wound is going in this direction. Remember, it exited that left side of the chest and then continued through the left arm. Um, so that is a photograph of that wound to the shotgun wound to the chest. All right. And We'll see uh, some more close-up images here in a minute, but uh, this is the entrance wound right here. Is that correct? Yes. And then we have we have some injuries right here. Is that where those yes. pedals exited that into the arm? That is where the um, yes, the um, uh, the wadding, which is the plastic piece of closing the pellets, um, terminated in the skin. It just didn't manage to get out. But all those pellets kind of got released from the wadding and went through um, the left the left arm. I'm going to move. That was states 478 for the record. I'm going to move now to states 479. And what does this, this image look? Okay. So this is a more close-up view of um, the entrance wound. And um, you can see that it looks like there's little, um, like almost squares or pegs sticking out of, of the edge. And um, that tells us that um, the wadding is starting to open because it opens up, it kind of opens up, there's petals. And this is a classic, I, I could put it in a book to say that this is um, consistent with um, a, a shotgun entrance wound. Okay, and we can see the dots around here. Those are from pieces of, um, of gunpowder that have basically impacted the skin because it's within a distance of three feet or so. Moving now to states 480. Okay. So um, usually when I take a photo, I don't want to go too close because then you won't be able to see where it is on the body. But here, this is recognized, this is the nipple, right? His left nipple. And we saw the entrance wound over here. And so here we have the, um, this is the an exit wound where this pink um, wadding is basically um, stuck right there. And you can see these are the petals on the edge, and that's what gave that unique appearance to the entrance wound. Now, this, this is basically a cylinder that encloses um, lots of pellets. And then the pellets here, we, we start to actually have some of the pellets coming through the surrounding skin and then along the left side of the um, lateral side of the chest, um, kind of below the arm. All right, and I'm going to show you what's been marked as states 111 already in evidence at this time. Do you recognize that? Yes, so the entrance um, pellet wound on the underside, the, the underside of the left arm. 
And um, interestingly enough, um, a lot of times pellets just go through the skin. But here we have some abrasions around the skin skin, and it actually corresponds to abrasions. We normally don't have abrasions with an exit wound, such as we have here. But the fact that we have abrasions in on the underside of, of the, the left side of the chest corresponding to the inside of the arm indicates that his arm was down at the time of um, this injury. So let me ask you about that. In your expert opinion, having done 5,500 autopsies, is there any way that Paul's hands were up when he suffered that shotgun wound to the chest that you've been talking about? Um, no, there, there, the, the autopsy answers that question that his arm was down by his side at the time he sustained this injury. And again, highlight the specific features that you observed that caused you to come to that expert okay. opinion. So if, let's just say hypothetically, if his arm was up, you see all of these abrasions around this exit defect and the abrasions around these pellet entrances, we wouldn't see that because they, um, the, those are caused by when when these pellets and the wadding is pressing up against the skin, the skin is very elastic. So this is just kind of logic. I think you're, you're all going to get this. It's kind of going to push the skin before it actually exits. The skin's going to stretch a lot. And if it hits up against the other portion of the skin, we have kind of abrasions, which are kind of scrapes on the skin around where it exited as well as where it entered. So... Um, these are sometimes called um, like a, it's a short exit wound. So the the the, um, the skin actually um, struck another area, uh, and in fact, it it corresponds exactly. It's like a reflection. We can see this is this is reflected. Here's this is this one is reflected over here. So um, if we can only get that kind of a mark if his if his arm is down. Now, this is the kind of thing that, you know, is, it's, it's a, the logical conclusion, and I'm confident that that was, was the position of his arm at the time he was shot. And this is based on my training and more than 20 years of experience doing these um, cases. All right. Let me uh, look at the next exhibit, which will be 482 for the record. And... Tell us, uh, tell us what you see okay. here, and also, if you could, how that also uh, supports the conclusions you were just talking about to yes. the jury. Okay, so these are um, the exit pellet wounds on the outside of the arm in this area, right? So this is kind of like his armpit here. And we can see these are kind of just, these pellet exit wounds don't have the kind of abrasions around it. This is just kind of finding its way through the skin. And then this one is over here. So, and if the further the pellets travel, it kind of splays out. So um, after the pellets um, leave the wadding that is open, it's, it, they're, they're spread. So, um, but these are, um, you know, exit um, pellet wounds, and we don't have the kind of abrasions to suggest that his arm was pressed up against anything at the time that those pellets exited. All right. Um, one other thing as well is uh, when talking about his arm being down, of course, the wadding stopped in, in that wound still in his chest. Correct? Yes. All right. Uh, let me, uh, let's move on. Just give me uh, one second here to get some other exhibits and show them to the defense counsel.
All right, Dr. Reamer, if I could get you maybe to stand that way just a little bit. I know we're, we're in tight confines and then we're trying to be re as respectful as we can with these images. Um, I'm going to show you now what's been marked as 483, states 484, states 485, 486, and 487. And uh, just quickly tell me if you recognize those, and then I want to go back to the board before we talk about those pictures. Yes, I recognize these. All right, and those uh, autopsy photographs that you took of yes. Paul Murdoch? These are photographs that I took at the autopsy of Paul Murdoch. And would they assist you in explaining to the jury the injuries that he suffered? Yes. Your Honor, this time I've moved states 483, 484, 485, 486, and 487 into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. They are admitted. under seal. Yes, sir. And, and for the record, I, these, these are under seal and I provided the cover sheets to the court reporter. Every exhibit except for the uh, poster board that we're doing, uh, the state would uh, request be under seal because of their graphic nature. Yeah. All right, uh, Dr. Reamer, let's, uh, that was, uh, and we'll come back a little bit more to that first injury, but there was a second shotgun injury as well. Is that correct? Correct. All right. And uh, I'm going to go back to state's 500, which is the poster board, and if you could uh, explain to and draw on this uh, this um, diagram that second injury, and then okay. we'll look at the picture. So there was a large shotgun wound defect to the top of his left shoulder, and um, there were lots of pellets recovered in the left shoulder area, and from there, the um, it kind of just went across the top of the left shoulder and then went into the left side of the neck and face. Okay. And from there, his face actually was not destroyed from this, but there is a big exit wound on the top of the right side of the head. So this wound went from his left toward his right and upward and with a slight front to back deviation. Now, what does that tell us? We don't really know. It's kind of going um, toward, it, it's sparing his face, it's going behind the face. Now, one thing that makes sense to me, how could that happen? If he was just standing, not everybody gets shot like standing like these diagrams, right? But if he was shot and his face was forward, it would have uh, taken off a lot of his face. However, if he is turned toward the shooter, then it's going to go into the face here and go out toward the right back of the head. So to me, it makes sense that his head is turned to the left. Um, not necessarily completely, but partially turned to the left. And um, what happened here was an extremely severe, immediately fatal injury because what it did was that after it went through um, the left side of the neck and face, um, it, our brain is basically held up through um, the skull. So we have bone at the top of the skull, but then we also have a bone that kind of holds up the brain. It went through the base of the skull, okay, which is kind of like in this area, the, the brain is up there. And this um, wound, actually, his brain, um, was ejected out of the top of the right side of his head and actually arrived at the autopsy in a separate bucket. So this, the force of this wound um, actually pushed his, the brain out of his head. There was only just a small piece of brain remaining and that's the brain stem that was attached to um, the spinal cord. All right, and, and real quickly, uh, going back to the, the first wound to the chest, if Paul was standing when he suffered that, could he have remained standing after suffering that wound? Yes. All right. The second wound, the one that starts in the shoulder and goes in here and then out the top of his head, what would have been the effect of that wound? That would have been immediately fatal and he would not have been standing. He would have just fallen to, fallen to the ground. All right. And would he have been capable at all of bracing his fall or anything like that within A catastrophic injury like that? Uh, no, that's instant, instantaneous death. All right. Did you notice any abrasions on his 
face or anything like that. Yes, he did have, um, and it's depicted in the, one of the photographs. Um, he does have a kind of a scrape on his face, um, and um, very frequently scrapes on the face that have they have a it has a slight directionality. It's consistent with a terminal collapse. So he's hitting the ground with some movement. There's frequently kind of a linear pattern, and you know the, all of this really makes sense. Um, when once you see these things, you can understand that if somebody is going to fall with, um, like, a, you know, the force of their body, and not, they're going to hit their face on the ground, and we get some abrasions that correspond to that. All right, and uh, let me do this real quick. If you could grab that dowel stick for me, and I'm going to make sure the jurors down here had a chance to see what you've been drawing. Okay, so that's the shoulder right yeah. there, and then yeah, I should have made a red mark here. To be consistent. This is the exit wound on the right side of the top. And the brain came out of, of that exit. Well, you, you mentioned a little bit about being consistent with Paul kind of having his head tilted to one side. If you could use the dowel stick, maybe use me as an example and, and show me kind of what you're what you're talking about. You okay. position me however you want to. Yeah, okay. Let's, let's go out here a little so bit. Yeah. to start with like a different idea. In, in order to understand how that's the case. So um, if a, a shotgun wound is entering the top of the left shoulder, and let's say his head is turned like that, it's gonna go right through the face, right? But if his head is turned like that, it's gonna space be able to behind the face. So if somebody's just standing looking straight ahead, it, this most likely would have done a lot of his face. But the fact that um, the face is remained intact tells me that his head was, um, I don't know, up and down, but his head was facing in the direction from where um, the, um, the shotgun was and then the injury to the shoulder would have been where if you just pointed to this? Yes. So uh, 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 it's kind of on the top of the shoulder. This also did not injure his chest cavity. It kind of went through a lot of the, the skin and muscle and, in fact, a blood shoulder. And there were, um, there, there were a lot of um, pellets that were recovered from the left shoulder area as well as um, the head. And and I'm going to uh, show you very quickly what's been marked as uh, stakes 110. And do you recognize any evidence? Um, yes, these are the um, pellets um, that I recovered from um, the left shoulder and head area. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead, and if you could uh, stay on that side so the jurors can see, and I'm going to. Um, this side? Yeah, if you could work on this side so that the jurors down with that end can see, and I'm going to look at some of these. Uh... All right, and I'm going to show you uh, first what's been marked as States 483. And can you tell me... Uh, what uh, what's on this particular image, particularly as to well, some of the things you were just describing as to the abrasion and things like that? Yes. So um, we can see this is basically an abrasion is a fancy word for scrape. So there are scrapes on the right side of his face. And you can see they, they kind of have, you can kind of see that there's a little bit of a linearity. So if he just felt completely flat, we might just get um, like, you know, dots, but the, if there's some movement, we get, it's it's kind of, he's hitting the ground and then moving a little bit as his hit, face hits, so we get this kind of vertical direction. And this is a very typical type of um, injury to the face that somebody might suffer from a terminal collapse. So after they sustain a fatal injury, what are they going to do? They're going to fall to the ground. Now, depending on the surface of, you know, if it's concrete, or you know grass we might get some but this is very typical of a, um, you know I don't know what kind of surface it was but it, a, a terminal collapse
All right, if you would, uh, with this image, and this would be Stuart States 484, uh, please explain to the jury using this image some of the concepts that you've okay. been describing. So this is the top of his left shoulder. And um, this is the continuation of the um, ammunition through the left side of the, the uh, lower face. And um, from there, it proceeded by a single, um, a single piece of ammunition here that went through the top of the left shoulder, it tore it up, right, and then went into the left side of his face and neck. And some of these pellets also damaged, did a lot of damage in the neck because they kind of splay out as they go further. And it went, some of them went actually through his airway and other structures of the neck, um, as well as continuing um, through the base of the skull and um, propelling the majority of the brain out the right side of the back of the head. Now, going to the sort of the, the end of that particular one, tell us what this okay. image represents. So, you know, you can um, kind of see, it looks like, like this piece of his head. We're not really seeing the entire thing because his forehead is basically still intact, but you can appreciate at this point that, um, you know, the contours of his skull are disrupted. And that's because um, there's a defect at the top of the skull, but not involved on the forehead, so it's kind of in the back. So we know it's, um, it was going, it started at the shoulder, it's been in the back. So his head may have been like that, um, toward the, facing toward the left. Um, okay, now this is, um, all right. Um, so this is, um, I can't, it's yes. hard for me to see what I'm doing. It's but. okay, yeah. yeah. So this is actually a, a photograph of um, the right side of, this is, this is his, um, the face area, okay? And I know that because I usually, when I take a photograph of, of the number, um, I usually have it like right side up, okay? So this is um, the top of his head, and this uh, is- Dr. Reamer, I apologize. No, hey, yeah, do it um, like that, yeah, that's good, better. right. So now you can sort of see, this is the right side of his head, and it's horrible, I know. Um, and there's a big defect there, and- um, um, we can see the inside of the skull, and but it, you know, his face was spared. So, 